can get started. Welcome to the IOE Rock Cut. I'm Bruce Maxwell, Professor of MSU IOE. And today we have Rob Walker with us. To to us. Rob is a professor of MSU Chemistry and Biochemistry. Um, and he also serves as the state coordinator for the Montana University System's cooperative PhD program in material science. So that stretches over the state. <laughs> 200 miles. Away. Yeah, 200 miles worth. Okay. Yeah, that's a very small portion of the state. Um, so, uh, Rob got, earned a BA in chemistry from Dartmouth College and a PhD in chemistry from the University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, asked, after postdoctoral work at the University of Oregon, he joined the faculty at the University of Maryland, College Park, in 1998. Funny how so many paths, just about everybody that's that's presented here had some path through Oregon. <laughs> Find that interesting. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, he uh, then moved to Montana State in 2009, where his research program continues to use optical spectroscopy to study chemical structure and reactivity at interfaces. Um, has published more than 100 scientific papers and successfully mentored more than 20 PhD students. His work has been recognized with an NSF Career Award, a Sloan Foundation Fellowship, and most recently a visiting faculty fellowship from the Danish Science Foundation. Um, so Walker's research program is currently supported by the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, and the Office of the Energy Research. Bob's going to talk to us a little bit today about the NSF EPSCOR program here in Montana and uh, about projects that's getting underway. Thanks, Chris. <coughs> okay, um, so uh, I'd like to uh, begin uh, by thanking all of you uh, for being here. Uh, I'm not sure how many more afternoons in calendar year 2018 are gonna have sunshine. Uh, and so the fact that you're giving it up to be here, I, I, I certainly appreciate it. Um, I'd like to thank Bruce for the opportunity to speak in the Rough Cut Seminar Series. And uh, just you know, to get this out of the way early, um, I, uh, you know, for a while now I've been suffering from some sinus and respiratory ailments. Um, I've already lectured today in Honors General Chemistry. Uh, so if my voice starts to give out, I will begin to gesticulate wildly and hope that, um, <laughs> yeah, or em emphatically, uh, and hope that that carries the day. Um, what I want to do is tell you today about a, uh, New about the, the new, as Bruce said, the new NSF uh, tr uh, track, uh, EPSCOR track one project that started, in fact, uh, started on, on Monday of this week, October 1st. Um, this, the title of the, title of the project, originally the proposal, now the project is shown here, right? The Consortium for Research on Environmental Water Systems, or CRUISE is how I'll be referring to it. And, uh, you know, to some people, uh, this title may be self-evident. It's like, oh, I know exactly what this is, what this project is going to be about. Um, others may be a bit baffled, saying, I'm really, you know, individually, I know what the words mean, uh, but how do they all fit together? Um, and what I want to do today is uh, first uh, provide a little bit of a historical perspective in terms of how we got to this point, uh, what the, the origin of uh, first the proposal and now the project. Um, uh, share a little bit about the administrative structure and uh, identify some of the key people uh, involved in the execution of this work. Uh, and then illustrate with uh, really just a case study or a site study, you know, an example of how the research team that's assembled, you know, thinks about and addresses uh, issues of water quality, contaminants from economic activities that get into environmental rivers and into rivers and streams how that impacts the ecosystem, the biota, and how that might influence communities as they make decisions about how to deal with that and how to manage it. Um, so the title of the talk uh, is From Molecules to Main Street. And you know, when, I, you know, when I look at the title of this proposal, if I you know, put on my reviewer's hat and you know, forget that I've been immersed in it for, for over, over three years now, um, you know, consortium seems like one of those words developed by uh, overeager program officers uh, to add to the lexicon of paradigm shifting and transformative and and, and, and I'm not quite sure what it means. Um, but we have the Consortium for Research on Environmental Water Systems. Um, and in fact, consortium research means something very specific and it means 
bringing together a number of participants or researchers from different disciplines focused in a common direction. And there's somewhere that got cut off here because the screen's not showing full screen. There's a, you know, the, the language of consortium research came out of, uh, uh, you know, came out of actually information systems initially. Um, and there are a number of criteria uh, that are, you know, that are a part, you know, that are considered a part of consortium research. One is, is that it, again, draws, it draws researchers from a wide variety of disciplines. Um, that there are resources to enable that research for an extended period. So multiple people working on a six month one-off project does not constitute con consortium research or consortium for research. Um, you, know, in the, in, you, know, you know, in the literature, uh, consortium research, at least one of, these, one of the definitions that's used is something that's over you know, two years or more in terms of a research project. And then the ability to, or the, the, the mechanisms to distribute and disseminate the discoveries from that research okay, uh, to, the, to the stakeholders, right, to the people impacted by, you know, by, by whatever's being investigated. And that really captures in a nutshell um, what CRUZ is all about. Uh, I would say that it starts with people who think small, uh, but that doesn't come out sounding very well. Uh, it starts, uh, uh, starts with, you know, uh, at, the, at, the, at the start of the food chain are people who think about small things, which I think sounds better. Um, you know, yeah, ch chemists, okay? engineers, chemical engineers, <coughs> uh, who think about molecules and molecular behavior and what do solutes do in solution. Okay? Cruz then, you know, you know, takes, you know, you know, brings people who think on, think on this scale together with people who think on how water moves through landscapes, okay? uh, flows, types of landscapes, forested, not forested, silicon, iron-based soils. Okay? Um, and then how water quality, how contaminants that get into water as the result of uh, human or economic activity influence the you know, quality of life, the decisions that are made by communities. And so it really brings, you know, so this is really taking research from the molecular level where some of the team is focused all the way to the social science impacts um, of, of water quality and water contaminants. Um, it was a long road to get here. Uh, a new road is starting uh, and uh, this is a bit misleading. Uh, the road to get here was not necessarily straight. Um, <coughs> in fact, uh, the start of this, pro of this program, uh, you know, this, or this program had its origins you know, three years ago, over three years ago. Uh, because it was in June in 2015 uh, that Ochi put out the call for white papers for the next, you know, soliciting ideas for the next uh, NSF Track One fellowship, uh, um, uh, uh, NSF Track One proposal, and uh, there were a number submitted, and I, I can't remember now exactly how many, but you know, maybe on the order of 10 to 12 were submitted across the U.S. And there was some down selection involved, and then um, a number of projects were invited to submit pre-proposals. I'll say pre-proposals in quotes because the pre-proposals were 10 pages, um, which is one of the longest pre-proposals I've ever seen. Um, but considering that the final proposal ended up being 283 pages, you know, maybe 10 pages does constitute a pre-proposal. So this went to, this went to this, these pre-proposals in November went to um, went to the uh, the Montana Science and Tech, uh, the Montana Science and Technology Committee, right, MSTC, uh, which is a group comprised of VPRs here at Montana State, Montana Tech, and U of M, okay. um, as well as a representative from OCHI. It was Janelle Booth at the time, now it's Joe Teal. Uh, and then a number of representatives from uh, the state legislature, both the, uh, you know, the House and the Senate, um, as, you know, and, and a number of, member, uh, number of folks from uh, the private sector. Okay. Um, and so they deliberated on these pre-proposals and invited uh, some folks to make a pitch, uh, make a 20 minute pitch that was in, you know, fast forward a bit in February, 2016. And at that point there were two proposals left standing. And there was a proposal that was led by Ray Calloway at the University of Montana. And I know, you know virtually all of you know Ray. Um, and that was a proposal entitled you know, Restoration and Resilience on Montana's Landscapes. And this was a proposal that drew, is there a, hmm, is there a way we can get that bottom? Not quite, we're missing some stuff down there at the bottom. I'm not showing up in the shares screen anyway. Okay. Um, all right. So um, there are a couple of lines below that, you know, that, that, that the bar is cutting off. Uh, but the, the, the restoration resilience proposal um, 
you know, as, you know, as, as its name suggests, focused on landscape restoration and resilience. It drew heavily from the expertise okay, and the advances made by IOE from 2011 to 2017. Uh, and you know, the goal was to improve statewide research and infrastructure, uh, statewide research infrastructure in relevant disciplines by conducting cutting edge research and restoration resilience science using four uh, social ecological systems. Um, and the four that were chosen uh, were river and lake systems, forest and forest dependent communities, crop, cropping systems and rangelands, and what you can't see down there is mining and energy landscapes. Um, so relied very heavily on, on, on uh, social and ecological science, on earth science. Uh, there was some big data that was a part of that as well. Um, and so that was, that, was, that, was one, that was one proposal. The other proposal was one that, you know, that I led. Um, it was the uh, Montana Center for Advanced Materials. And this was an effort that grew out of a, the collaborative PhD program that spans three campuses, MSU, Montana Tech, and, and, and UM, and started a few years before this, this came, you know, before these pre-proposals went in. And through that program, we had established very strong ties we had developed uh, mechanisms for developing, uh, for delivering coursework synchronously, uh, pretty rigorous curriculum in material science and engineering. Okay? Uh, and we were getting investigators, individual investigators in the molecular, the physical sciences, and in engineering, you know, talking with each other and exploring research opportunities. Some of this was catalyzed by the MREDI effort of a few years back. Uh, and this was the focus of the Center for Advanced Materials was to enable the discovery, characterization, and application of new materials. And materials, you know, not just any material, but materials that had specific relevance for Montana, you know, for, you know, uh, for Montana's interests. Okay. Materials that, you know, could aid in the development of energy conversion technologies. Biomaterials. Materials that could be used for environmental conservation and remediation. And so, so these were the two uh, projects that got pitched, and uh, you know, that was in February. A couple weeks later, MSTC came back and said, um, "We really like both. Okay. Uh, both proposals are really strong in some areas, and both proposals have some flaws or some some pieces that are lacking in other areas. So just get together and come up with a winning idea. <laughs> it's harder than it sounds." <laughs> it's harder than it sounds because um, the sort of the expertise, the, the scholarship that went into the Center for Advanced Materials, we identified you know, uh, 40 or more possible participants spread, spread across six campuses in the Montana University system, 16 different departments. I mean, if you want to talk about herding cats, this is, you know, this is a PhD exercise in herding cats. Um, and it was, again, heavily weighted towards molecular science and engineering. Um, the restoration resilience proposal uh, identified you know, 25 or more participants, um, many of whom are, are here, um, involved explicitly five campuses across the Montana University system, <coughs> um, as well as one tribal college, that was SKC, um, 12 different departments, and again, it drew heavily on social and ecological science, on, uh, on um, environmental science, and again, some, some big data development in there as well. And you know, to you know, a number of folks who are in this room and, and at UM uh, have been a part of this effort over the years now, years it really has been. Uh, it was, you know, there were some bumps along the way. Um, there were, you know, there was some tension at times. Uh, you know, to my embarrassment, uh, those of you who know Maury Vallette, my first words to Maury Vallette were, um, uh, do stream ecologists work with hypotheses? And if you know Maury, um, yeah, yeah, that, yeah that, that, that elicited a rise. Um, the, I am, I, yeah, I, I'm only a chemist. Um, but through that, you know, uh, and, you know, you know, through, you know, you know, through, the, you know, over the, you know, you know, we overcame the obstacles. You know, we we worked through the tensions. It, um, we we had to make some hard decis decisions along the way because while there was some overlap between the 40 plus and the 25 plus. Um, we needed a much more focused and and uh, a much more focused and and and, and knit together team. Um, it is a really fun team now. It's a team that consists of 22 uh, investigators, and I'll introduce them in a little bit. Um, and the outcome of all of this, after these twists and turns, uh, was a uh, was a proposal that was a, that was our, the highest recommended in the cohort of eight EPSCOR track one proposals that went in 
uh, in August 2017. Um, uh, August 2017, it went in. It actually went in almost simultaneous, almost simultaneously with the eclipse. Right. So you know, so as you know, as, as the skies were darkening over Montana, our future was getting bright. Um, you know. Uh, we we received word of approval. Uh, they had been recommended for uh, recommended for funding um, in in, uh, in in the spring, uh, and then various things needed to happen. And again, project approval was the start of this fiscal year, October first. Um, so this, again, the, the the program is the you know, Consortium for Research on Environmental Water System or CRUISE. You know, and a lot of words there. You don't need to uh, focus on all of them. But okay, fine. What is it? You know, and if you, you know, read through, and this is on the, uh, the Montana NSF EPSCoR website now. Um, you know, this is a consortium. It brings together researchers at three campuses, Tech, UM, uh, three, three MUS campuses, Tech, UM, and, and, and MSU. Mo uh, University of Montana is the lead institution. Um, two tribal colleges, Little Bighorn and Salish Kootenai. Uh, it, we have contacted, we have been in touch with, and we are looking to integrate uh, statewide decision makers in various agencies. So the Montana, Montana Department of Agriculture, uh, MDRP, uh, Fish, Wildlife and Parks, uh, DEQ, okay. um, to study how water quality impacts, you know, water quality is impacted by hard rock mining, by intensive agriculture, um, and by energy extraction activities. And that's, you know, that's um, code for coal mining in the Powder River Basin. Um, bring together faculty and students, again, from you know, the molecular sciences and engineering up to uh, yeah, earth, environmental and earth sciences. Uh, there are folks dedicated to uh, sensor development uh, and, and, and uh, sensor technology and natural resource and social sciences. And what we... Uh, what do we need to look out for right now? Okay. Uh, so that was a presidential alert. It's a test of the National Wireless Emergency Alert System. So if your phone was not buzzing, um, you want to check on it. Because um, <laughs> it really is. Okay, it's on silent. Um, What's uh, DDQ? Department of Environmental Quality. Um, yeah, so you know, then there are some goals. And, and so the, that top one is, is, is research capacity, but there's education, professional development, there's partnerships with the private sector, um, beyond you know, uh, impact beyond the, you know, beyond the state, and you know, to build the research enterprise across the state. We are in the uh, closing days now of an exercise to develop a strategic plan. This st strategic plan is a 50-page document full of milestones and metrics that the NSF will use to, to assess, you know, are you doing a good job? Are you following through on what you said you were going to do? And if, and if not, then you know, they have the right. It's a, it's a cooperative agreement. It's a contract of sorts, right? They can turn off the money at any time. Uh, that strategic plan has seven elements to it. Um, I'm gonna focus you know, the balance of the time here on the research uh, because I think that's what people are most interested in. But you know, recognize that there are a lot of moving parts that I won't talk about today and a lot of people involved who will not get acknowledged today because they are involved in other elements of the cruise, of the cruise project. Um, a big sprawling project deserves its own big sprawling org chart, right? That's there. Um, we, yeah, this is, so we, you know, we're moving from the history now into uh, just a little bit about the organization of, of, of Cruise. Um, and, you know, we, you know, the, we answer, you know, ultimately we answer to the, uh, to OCHI, you know, to the BOR and the, and the commissioner. Uh, that group is advised uh, by the Montana Science and Technology Committee. Again, it's a collection of DPRs and, uh, state representatives and some folks in the private sector, uh, and then it fans out from there to the to the you know what I'll call the boots on the ground. And the boots on the ground, the people who are responsible for the day-to-day -day operational execution of crews, you know, are here. Um, you know, we live and die by Ray Calloway. Um, you know, Ray Calloway is is the project director. Um, is a Regents professor in ecology over in uh, at the University of Montana, and you know, Ray, you know, ultimately ultimately Ray is the person to whom the NSF will look. To say, uh, you know, and say, you know, you, you know, you're doing what you said you were going to do, you know, or you're not. Um, Ray is, you know, Ray is the is the top of the food chain, and he is assisted by a management team, a project management team, with folks, administrative folks, and financial folks, and some research folks who are spread across UM, MSU, and Montana Tech. Um, the science leads, what you can't see is blocked by the bar down there. Is the science leads are are are, are Maury Vallette, at the University of Montana, and me um, here at Montana State, and talk a little bit about what the science, what the role of the science leads 
you know, what the role is. Um, but we lead a group again of 22 individuals. Um, you can see you know, their last names, their, their, their last names, their, their affiliations, their individual areas of expertise. These initials up here will become clear in a little bit. Um, you know, but it's a group that is focused on various aspects, both big and small, of water quality and the impacts of economic activity on, on, on water quality. You know, this is where, um, you know, this is where the molecular sciences uh, meet the social sciences and, and, and the earth sciences. Um, the questions that we are addressing are really pretty simple when you get down to it, right? This is about water quality. This is about stuff that's, you know, you know what's in those rivers and streams in Montana and how is that impacted by, you know, by different activities? Um, so, you know, what are the important questions? If we're talking about water quality, we want to know what's there. And that's going to require the use, use in the development and the deployment of sensors. Um, we want to know how much, again, yeah, sorry. How much, um, you know, there's some sensors there, there's some chemistry there. Okay. Where did it come from? You know, that's, you know, that, you know this, is really getting, this is really getting into the mechanism now of how contaminants are released into water. You know, were they added intentionally? Did they leach out of soils? Okay. Okay. How long will it persist? And we are now starting to come into the, you know, we're now starting to bridge you know, the molecular sciences with the landscape sciences. You can think about, you know, how long will it persist doing a benchtop measurement in a little beaker in a laboratory? Or you can think about a very large scale and maps of salinity, you know, across an aquifer, the aquifer region in the Powder River Basin. Um, how long will it, you know, how long will it persist? You know, the ecological impact, if there is bad stuff in the water, what will it do? Okay. You know, how does the ecology, you know, adapt? To the presence of contaminants in, in environmental waters, and you know, finally, you know, how do you know how do all of these questions sum up to uh, SUM? Sum up to you know uh, how communities decide how to manage their water, how to make decisions in terms of water distribution, perhaps you know, agricult uh, changing changing or adapting agricultural practices. You know, these are the questions that are driving crew's research, and now. What we did as this group came, came together and, and, and nucleated, uh, condensed, we're talking about water, so I can use the word condensed. As this group condensed and began to think about the research that we were going to do, um, you know, it was clear that there was a variety of interests and a variety of expertise that were present. Um, and so what we settled on was we settled on water quality issues in three representative Montana waterways. And we thought, yeah, and so one area that attracted, you know, that was of interest to a large number of folks was the impact of hard rock mining and the, the waterway that, you know, the, you know, the best, you know, uh, symbolizes that or, you know, uh, you know, embodies the impact of hard rock mining is Upper Clark, Upper Clark Fork. You know, starts just outside of Butte, Montana, you know, and, you know, eventually runs through Missoula and, and out into, eventually makes its way to the snake. Oh, it, Oh, eventually, the Pacific, eventually, the Pacific Ocean via the Columbia, via the Columbia but the Columbia. Okay, um, you know, um, another important economic activity um, is you know in, in Montana, obviously, is agriculture. You know, this is both crop agriculture as as as, as well as as well as uh, you know rangeland management and you know, uh, livestock. And you know, the waterway that was chosen to represent you know the impacts that agriculture can have on water quality was the Judith River watershed. And this was driven in part by some expertise in the group it brought together, um, as well as existing boots on the ground from a number of projects, including an, uh, one of the EPSCOR, I think track two pro, uh, projects that's, that's continuing, looking at uh, cropland um, rotations up, uh, you know, up in the Judith River watershed right now. And then the last area, the last area we, um, the last you know, type of economic activity, the impact of water quality was energy extraction. And, you know, energy extraction, you, you know, one might immediately think of, oh, you know, energy extraction, you know, Mountain West, Bakken, right? You want to do Bakken. Um, but, you know, a lot of Bakken and a lot of Bakken's impact, it's, you know, it's right there on the, you know, on the edge of eastern Montana. A lot of it's in, 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 in North Dakota. And we wanted something that was a little, you know, and, and Bakken had attracted a lot of attention. What hadn't attracted a lot of attention, at least from the, uh, from the molecular and an engineering standpoint is water quality uh, related to uh, surface coal mining. And for that, we turn to the Powder River Basin. So the Powder River Basin, it's actually the Powder River Basin starts in Wyoming, uh, but then runs up through Southeast Montana, uh, eventually you know, uh, connecting you know, to the Yellowstone and then to, and then to the Missouri you know, and then to the Mississippi. Um, and, and, and so we settled on these three 
water, you know, these three water systems to look at water quality. Right? And they were impacted by different, you know, uh, representative Montana industries. Um, again, the collection of people, diverse group of expertise, collection of expertise. You know, some folks are interested in measure, in knowing what's there. Right? And those are the sensors and the synoptics and, uh, and, and the signal, signaling people. Um, you know, and so there, and you know, there's some here, there are, you know, there's some at the University of Montana. And so developing sensors and deploying sensors to understand what's there in, in, the, in, the, you know, in the Clark and the Judith and the powder. Um, a number of molecular scientists and engineers uh, were interested in mechanisms of the chemistry, of the, uh, the kinetics, the reactivity of these water systems. And so you know, there's a group here at Montana Tech and University of Montana, you know, focusing on Molecular and molecular and molecular engineering issues in the Clark, Judith, the powder, and then the impact of these contaminants on ecology, um, on the ecology of, of of the Clark, the Judith, and the powder was captured in this third column, this C's column, and surrounding all of this was uh, was was you know were the, were were some social scientists, um, uh, Julie Haggerty is one, Lizzie Metcalf is another, who said, look, this is complicated. You know, we want to treat this as a wicked problem. I said, yeah, it is absolutely a wicked problem. Before I knew that wicked problem actually meant something. <laughs> you, know, I, 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 you know, I grew up more or less in the Boston area where wicked uh, is actually, it is used as an adjective, um, which means great. Um, this is different. Uh, you know, a, a, wicked, a wicked problem is one that is so complex with so many variables that it eludes a, a it eludes an answer. Right, a, a resolvable answer. There's no well-defined stopping point. And if I say something wrong, Julie will correct me in, you know, in a little bit. But um, you know, in the it, it, in the efforts to try and solve a wicked problem, you know, one often identifies new problems that you had, didn't know were there in the first place. Okay. Hypotheses you realize are you know inextricably coupled from each other. So there's again no clear resolution maybe to the question that you ask. Okay. Uh, and in fact, in the process of trying to solve one, you know, address one question or solve one problem, you may create others. Okay. Nevertheless, this is important, right? You know, uh, you know humans are, humans are, are, are messy systems, uh, but, they, it, but it certainly deserves you know, the attention and the research and, and the way to understand how all of these, so maybe ivory tower or you know, environmental towers, you know, impact you know, the communities we live in and the decisions we make. So this was the structure that developed, and this is what guided crews. This was known as the, um, you know, we never had a viewing session of the matrix. Um, perhaps we should at some point. Uh, but this was our matrix, you know, and we identified, you know, where we were on the matrix when talking about you know, specific projects. Um, what I want to do is I want to focus on you know, some of the time now on, on, on one specific row and illustrate how research activities across that row, you know, that, you know, you know really form a, really form, you know, constitute consortium research, bridging scales and bridging disciplines. Um, so the Judith River is, uh, is uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, a relatively small water system that runs through central Montana uh, with, uh, with its headwaters uh, scattered. There are a couple of contributors, but you know, one's up in Lewistown. Um, it runs through areas dedicated to intensive uh, non-irrigated wheat and cattle production. And the, th <clears throat> the threat here um, is that in the Judith River watershed, um, nitrate concentrations in, in shallow, shallow aquifers measured in, in wells um, ha, are routinely above drinking, uh, drinking water limits. And uh, the EPA regulatory limit is 10 milligrams per liter, which you know, ends up working to 10 ppb. Um, you know, these, these nitrate levels are rising. Okay? While you might have ideas about why they're rising, you know, those hypotheses might, are, are certainly, as of right now, untested. You know, the origins are unknown. And also because of the intensive dryland agriculture, um, you know, pesticides, uh, you know, synthetic organics, you know, include pesticides and herbicides and you know other, you know, synth you know, synthetic organic materials that are applied to try and improve crop yield and and, and you know, crop resilience to you know to, to stress. Um, the impact of these synthetic organics on the water systems are, you know, are poorly ca characterized. And so the goal of the Judith River team is to understand how intensive agriculture interacts with high, natural hydrological dynamics to control nitrate and uh, you know, as, uh, synthetic organic you know, concentrations and distributions across, across the landscape. Um, you know, this is a team, it's led by Stephanie Ewing. She's had a long running interest in the Judith. Uh, she, uh, starting I think in 2012 or 2013, uh, began working on it, actually Adam, you would know, 
2012. 2012. Okay. Uh, a, a U.S. Um, and it was a USDA, it was a USDA, a USDA grant uh, to look at uh, water movement and nitrate concentrations. Um, this is Adam Sigler's uh, dissertation topic. Uh, Stephanie leads a team uh, comprised of eight, um, you know, very happy people. Um, you know, and, and you can see them here. Um, the, the colors denote their institutional affiliation. Uh, so blue is, is Montana State, green is Montana Tech. Uh, the maroon is, 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 is University of Montana. And again, you know, here's, here are the questions that guide our inquiry. What's there? All the way down to what are, what are communities gonna do about it? And so if we're gonna ans answer what's there, you know, this falls into the realm of environmental sensors, synoptics, and, 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 and signals. And uh, if we wanna know what's there, we need to be able to measure something. And that means we need sensors capable of measuring things like uh, or, you know, dissolved, uh, dissolved oxygen, Dissolved, car dissolved organic carbon, uh, pH. It'd be nice to measure uh, nitrogen on the fly, you know, and other species that are there. And so that's the relies upon state of the art sensors, uh, synop you know, and then using those data to develop the inferential software based on you know based on on the measurements that are made. Um, this is an effort that's spearheaded by Rob Payne, who's here. Uh, Mike De Grand Prix is a faculty is on the faculty chemistry faculty at U of M. He is also he spun up you know he used some of his discoveries some years back to spin off a company called Sunburst Sensors uh, that makes uh, sensors for various water properties that are you know salt and fresh water used all over the world now. And he also has ties to Woods Hole. Um, you know this is an example of you know it's you know it ain't it, you know you know you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, you know, it may not look pretty, but you know, here's a sensor and it's gonna be out there and it's measuring dissolved oxygen and dissolved inorganic carbon, because uh, nitrates and uh, dissolved organic carbon. Um, you know, here's what the data look like. You're, you're just measuring as a function of time or as a function, a function of day, you know, what's, what's there and how does it vary over time? How does it vary over season? Okay. And then the intent then is to take those data and to develop some predictive capacity or some predictive capability to use those data and say, okay, you know, uh, with certain environmental stress, whether it's drought or heavy rainfall, whether it's some sort of um, you know, uh, field burning or, or livestock moving, how are these properties going to change? And so again, it's Rob, it's Mike, Mike de Grand Prix, and recently joining the University of Montana, he's up at the Flathead Lake Biological Station running the show up there, is Bob Hall. He came, he came to the Montana University system. Um, here, there's, there's Bob. Um, you know, from uh, I think the University of Wyoming, um, just just this past year. Um, you know, sensors are great. <laughs> Sorry, great sensors are great. Um, yeah, sensors can tell you what's there at a point as a function of time. It does not give you real time distribution of of, of materials, and for that we appeal to uh, we we appeal uh, we appeal to Joe uh, Joe Shaw in you know, MSU's electrical engineering and building on work that evolved out of the M-Ready program, um, precision agriculture, what Joe will be doing is he'll be mounting hyperspectral images so here onto drones, which is actually even cooler than it sounds. Um, and you know what, through M-Ready, this was the development of precision agriculture, and Joe could fly these, these drones that measured uh, changes in reflectivity and colors um, over, well, over large scales, you know, and differentiate different types of plants and crops, and ultimately, if weeds were growing in, in fields, uh, could do this remotely because it's a drone, right? You, you, you fly it wherever you want. Um, want to apply this technology for river systems. So fly the drone over the Clark. You know, use that use discoveries made over the Clark to fly over the Judith, and look for distributions again in color, okay? reflectivity, to infer. You know, do we have blue algae? Do we have green algae? Do we have clean water? Do we have, you know, do we have, do, uh, you know, do we have turbid water? And, and so this is all part of the environmental sensor synoptics and signals. Um, well, if you know what's there and you know how much of it's there, uh, the question is, where did it come from? <coughs> you know, and this is, you know, this is where, you know, this is where the landscape meets, you know, the landscape meets the, you know, the landscape people meet the, meet the chemist. Um, you know, where did it come from, you know, from a very large perspective? This is, you know, Stephanie and Rob Payne's wheelhouse. And you can want, again, explicitly link hydrologic and biogeochemical pathways of chemical flux, right, nitrates, synthetic organics, okay, along, you know, you know, characteristic process domains, which, you know, in, 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 the, in the environmental sciences world means through soils, you know, through aquifers, you know, through surface waters like streams. Okay? And, 
You can imagine a couple of different landforms. You can, um, you know, this is you know, this is work from Stephanie. You know, uh, a terrace where the where the snow comes, where the snow melt comes off the mountain and then splits, okay, following two pathways, uh, versus a terrace where the water comes down and spreads is distributed more uniformly across across the landscape. And what does that do for the distribution of, you know, of of, of the species of interest? Okay, that's a, a, a map of the a map of the Judith River Basin and, and all of its glory. Uh, and the the intent here is to pair studies of streams to you know couple the studies of streams on the you know on the hydrologically isolated moccasin terrace that's up here and, uh, with the connected alluvial fan where the where the you might expect species are more uniformly distributed. Um, you know there 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 it is. Yeah. Um, you know thinking specifically about a landform. You can think about, there we go. <coughs> you can think about how this, how this research will actually be done. Uh, you can put a sensor here at an upstream site. We can take advantage of exist, existing state resources. So this is a Department of Agriculture monitoring right here. Maybe put a sensor at a downstream site and then measure what's there and try to understand the flow and the, 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 the distribution of, 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 of species, nitrates, synthetic organics, um, across the landform. And I think what is not, there. Yeah, what's not there, what is only hinted at in the blue box, um, is to understand us to you know, correlate this landform with chemical reaction pathways and the persistence of species that are, you know, that are there. And, you know, uh, to at least some folks in the front row, um, starting from Valerie over, um, and a few others out there, you say, ah, reaction pathways, that sounds like molecules. Okay. Um, so how long is stuff going to stay? How long is stuff going to stay in the environment? Right? How, you know, um, if the nitrate concentration is is high here and low there, where did it go? And so, there we go. Just do this again. Oh, come on. There we go. Um, and so, you know, Eric Grumstrup here in chemistry and biochemistry, Jack Skinner, who is in mechanical engineering at, 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 at Montana Tech, but he's, he's really much more of a, he is, he is a very good mechanical engineer, uh, but, he, but he's better than that. Uh, he is, <laughs> he's, he's, uh, he, he's, he's, very, he's very much a material scientist. I mean, he thinks about bonds being formed and bonds breaking. Uh, he thinks about functional materials and their applications, you know, beyond just, you know, you know, beyond sort of what one would think of as a traditional mechanical engineer. And what, they're, what they will be studying on the bench top um, is nitrate photocatalysis. And so if we lose nitrate concentration between point A and point B, again, where did it go? You know, maybe there's a reservoir. You know, maybe it got absorbed or adsorbed by something, uh, but maybe it reacted away. And there's reason to believe that that's true in the literature. And, you know, there are a number of different materials. So for example, specifically iron oxide, it has photocatalytic properties. And so if you have iron oxide and you expose it to sunlight, you can look at the band gap which is here, the energy required to create, create an excited electron in, in, in the iron oxide. And if that excited electron is there, that can photocatalyze nitrate reduction. Okay. Is that a viable process? Is there exposed iron oxide in the soil between point A and point B? Um, if so, then this becomes a viable mechanism for denitrification of, of, of surface waters and possibly aquifers as well. Okay. You can take this one step further and say, if we understand the mechanisms of denitrification in natural systems, perhaps we can engineer materials Either, either morphologically going from, from large scale or you know, clay-like iron oxide particles to nano iron oxide particles and maybe zero valent iron oxide particles and, and create materials that are, in, you know, that are increasingly efficient at driving denitrification. And then turn right around and see if we can use these, these engineered materials to create fabrics, to create webs of, you know, uh, these, so this is electrospun fibers, okay, polymers, okay, that can be used to create mats can be create filters. And if those are, uh, those are effective at denitrification, then, you know, then we're onto something. We're onto something that might be able to make a difference in reverse osmosis filters you know, to remediate well water. Uh, you know, obviously, we're not going to take the Judith River and you know, divert it and you know, send it through and send it through one of, one of these, although it was considered at one point. Um, uh, there, there was food and beer involved. Um, <laughs> But this idea then of taking functional materials and driving the design of functional materials for effective, you know, more effective membranes to use in reverse osmosis filters. 
uh, to develop materials uh, that can, are resistant to fouling by synthetic organics and by nitrates and by bacterial communities. Um, and understanding how, nitrate, you know, how nitrates, synthetic organics, and some of their products um, are absorbed in things like biofilms, in molecular membranes. This is going to be the work of Catherine Zodro at Montana Tech, and, and this is where my research group comes into play. Uh, and then, you know, pulling it all together, you know, what impact does any of this have on, 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 on communities, on, on social science? Oh, that's Julia Haggerty. You know, and, uh, you know, uh, Julia and her colleague at University of Montana, Libby, are, are, are awfully excited about sort of the range and scope of this work. You know, can historical trajectories of, and of adoption and diffusion and form remediation applications. They will look at the historical record and track from the historical record how you know issue you know how item you know chemical fallow was applied over the years and over the, over the landscape. They're, they will compare, you know, what the what the what the record shows with the recollections and the experiences of the operators in the fields. Right, this is very time intensive. I think Julia on Monday said that this is very inefficient research. It takes a lot of time, okay? uh, but it is very much worth it because you get the human perspective in terms of how all of these chemical and environmental principles really apply to, you know, really apply to, you know, practice as, practice as they are practiced. Um, and, for, you know, and, from this, and from this work, you know, the you know, issue of uh, trying to establish trust, you know, and you know, governance and community resilience, um, outcomes are gonna be growth and in social, you know, from, from Julia's, Julia and Libby's work is gonna be growth in environmental and social science infrastructure. Okay? Uh, and then some pieces that got cut off here, but it's, you know, hopefully this illustrates how, you know, from the very small to the very large, research disciplines can come together and address questions that aren't identical but are related and leading to a big, cohesive understanding of how chemistry, you know, impacts, you know, imp you know impact, impacts the landscape and our communities. Um, I'm not going to go through in any great detail, uh, but we can do similar, you, know, you can imagine how across the roads you can do you know, similar activities for the Upper Clark Fork, which was severely, you know, which was, has been badly impacted by, uh, has been adversely impacted uh, by the mining legacy of Butte and, and the smeltering activities in Anaconda. Uh, that mining legacy is, is, is compounded now by nitrogen enrichment and high phosphorus availability. And there are tremendous gradients in uh, contaminants and pollutants and ecological conditions across there. And so this is work being led by Maury Vallette. He is the team lead on this. Uh, and he's, got, he's, he's working with a group of, 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 of 10 folks here. Uh, there is some overlap. Across the different like across the different sites, uh, so you'll see a couple of repeat offenders here, like like Rob Payne and Bob Hall, like the Grand Prix. Uh, actually, uh, 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 Joe is being a repeat offender here too, I guess. Um, and and you know and other folks addressing you know related questions: How does molecular behavior impact transport and reactivity, and the ecology, okay? uh, and ultimately the communities along the Upper Clark Fork? Uh, everything from food webs, this is why cross, uh, to efforts to uh, use nanoparticles to remove and then reuse elements like copper and zinc from waterways. And this is Jerry Downey working with Ben Coleman, um, Montana Tech and U of M. So I'm going to skip, just so that there's some time for questions, to the last couple of pieces. Um, you know, you can see from the people there, many of whom are known to many of you, um, this EPSCOR proposal and this EPSCOR award didn't come out of a vacuum, right? It brought together very talented people across three campuses in different colleges and different departments with different training and different prejudices to, you know, to create this, this, this research infrastructure. You know, and if you go through the roster, you can see, you can, you can, you can track that folks, you know, folks on the, on the crew science team have connections to a whole host of, Institutes and centers you know, across MUS, whether it's you know, you know whether it's you know, Center for Biological Biomolecular Structure and Dynamics at U of M, Institute on Ecosystems, you know, you know, virtually everyone here, um, Optech, you know, the Optical Technology Center that Joe you know that Joe's responsible for, Wyatt's you know, Water Center, and, you know, and so on. Um, so it's you know one of the one of the goals, and in fact, one of the metrics that you know that will be used. To hold us accountable, and it's one that we want to be used to, you know, to hold us, you know, to, you know, to hold us accountable. Is at the end of the day, five years from now, right, when cruise, you know, when the EPSCOR Track One 
runs its course and the last penny of that $20 million is spent. Have we strengthened research infrastructure? Have we strengthened ties? Have we strengthened collaborations between these organizations here? Because in doing that, the research enterprise in the state is gonna be much stronger. Maybe something new grows out of this. Uh, but our, our, our paramount goal is to, is, is, is to strengthen research infrastructure. We wanna stimulate competitive research not just within each of these institutes or centers, you know, but across them. You know, and so, um, you know, that's you know, all motherhood and apple pie, of course, we all want to do that. Uh, we can, in fact, do that a little bit. Um, and this is for folks uh, who are you know, not involved in the cruise effort right now. Written into the cruise budget, written into the cruise operating system are ways to expand the research team, expand the research infrastructure to adapt, to evolve, and to, and, and to broaden you know, the questions that we can address. And so in years two through five, uh, with a real, you know, the real active time being years two and three, but it goes throughout, uh, there'll be opportunities for seed awards. Um, and so there are three different seed funding mechanisms uh, that are, uh, you know, there's a research seed, so I have a good idea. Uh, it needs to be aligned with, 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 with cruise activities. Um, you know, ideas for, new materials for a heart, effective heart transplant, you know, while laudable and may get you a phone call from Stockholm someday, uh, probably wouldn't be appropriate here because it's not an environmental water system. Um, you, know, you know, these, you know, seed grants, you know, get something started. Okay? And, you know, I'm speaking for myself right now, not for the management team. My hope, my intent is that seed funding will be available for anyone not a member of the original crew science team. Right. This, is intent, this is intended really to, you know, not, you know, you know, not support ongoing efforts within crews, but to, to widen, you know, to make a bigger umbrella or whatever the analogy is we need to use. It. Um, there are some workforce development seeds. Um, so these are uh, for the two and the four year Montana campuses, um, different from research, right? So this is workforce development. This is training. This is, um, you know, you know, it's workforce training, workforce development. Uh, and then there's a specific project set up for the tribal colleges. Uh, before anyone asks the question, um, how do I get involved with this? Uh, the answer is, <coughs> I can't tell you yet. Uh, not because it is a, a, you know, not because it's a double secret state secret, um, uh, but because we don't know. It is still a work in progress. We are, you know, working with the NSF to design, you know, protocols and procedures um, so that we can, you know, get all of these programs and, and you know, up and running. Uh, what I will say is through IOE and through other institutions, stay tuned because probably sometime in February or March, there will be a call for seed proposals and for workforce development seeds and, and for tribal college seeds. You know, and, and, and that's the time when, you know, you know, you know that's the time when, when, when people, you know, should think hard about, you know, does my, do my interests align with the interest of crews? Uh, there'll also be student internships, so undergraduate, fellow, undergraduate internships and commercialization internships. Um, so we're at the acknowledgments point. Um, it's, you know, depending on how you, I'm not sure when one becomes a scientist. You know, I, you, know, you know, whether, you know, whether it's after you get your degree or when you declare your major in college or something like that. Um, you know, if it's somewhere in between those two, um, you know, so I've been in the business for about 25 years and this has been one of the most rewarding uh, and you know, ultimately satisfying experience that I've, been, I'm, uh, that I've ever been a part of. Right? I'm talking to people that I would never have imagined talking to before agencies I you know, didn't even know existed at the time um, and seeing how, how ties can be made. Uh, a lot of, you know, the, you know what makes, sort of, uh, makes it worth getting up in the morning and, and fun on a day-to-day -day basis is the, is the, is the, crew, is the crew science and, 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 and management team, right? So, you know, starting with Ray and Maury and Stephanie and Jerry Downey at Tech, Shell um, out at UM, uh, and Todd, uh, who, you know, uh, he, he, he's bigger than he looks. Uh, he's getting cut off by the bar here. Um, yeah, yeah, Todd here. Um, none of this is possible without the encouragement, the support, and the vision of the VPRs, right? Ultimately, it was the VPRs at, you know, here uh, at Montana Tech and at U of M who said, uh, these are great ideas. Get together, figure it out. Um, and, you know, whether they knew their genius at the time, or it's only apparent in hindsight, uh, and we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they absolutely knew what they were doing in advance. Um, you know, they have been instrumental in driving this forward and making this a you know what was, was a pretty exciting uh, opportunity for I think I think for for the state and for the researchers in the state. 
Uh, the one person we don't recognize here is this fellow here. I, um, as I was putting this together, I needed to call out Kelvin Chu. Kelvin is a, um, he's a consultant from the implementation group, or TIG. Uh, this is an implementation group that is uh, uh, really is, comp you know, comp uh, is comprised of a bunch of um, former program officers, NSF and in other places, uh, who realized there was more money to make outside of the, uh, out, you know, if you were not on a GS pay scale. Uh, so they formed a consulting group, and it was Kelvin who worked with us. Uh, he was hired by he was hired by the state to work with us, and he held our feet to the fire. He kept us honest. If we had ideas that we thought were great, he took us out of our echo chamber and said, "No, nope, those ideas really aren't so great." Um, and he, you know, and, and if we had, and if there were ideas that really were great, he said, "That's a really good idea." Have you considered expanding things in this way, that way, or some other way? And so, really, the proposal became, you know, as as good a proposal was because of you know, because of uh, you know, Kelvin riding herd on all of us. And so with that, it uh, looks like there are about six or seven minutes left. Um, what can I say? Thanks. Uh, you got questions? I'll try to answer them or deflect the questions to the experts in the field, many of whom are here right now. So uh, thanks again for this opportunity. Questions for us? I think we have people on the outside. If you push your button on the little bar thing. Other side can hear you. You don't have one? Okay, that's a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I ducked that one. So, Bob, yeah. um, one question that was on my mind is what is bad about nitrate and water? <coughs> um, well, was, okay, so I, I, will, I, will take, I will take a first stab at that, um, and then I will, I, I, again, toss it up to people who know. Um, so, Nitrate above 10 milligrams per, per liter uh, has been known to, known to cause a uh, uh, condition in infants, uh, which is methema. What's, yeah, the, right, uh, where, uh, it, um, they can't breathe. Uh, they, 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 they turn blue, um, and, and and so you want and so you know after, and I think these standards were set in the 1960s. Adam would probably know best. Um, but 10 milligrams per liter were was, was the standard. That's an order of magnitude less for nitrite, uh, which is even more harmful. Nitrite can then react to f with amines to form nitrosamines, and those are definitively carcinogenic. That's why you should. Um, that's why you shouldn't eat bacon, you know, sort of three meals a day. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but, the, but these are nitrogen oxide species, and nitrate is is the most ubiquitous and primary offender. Adam, do you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, the, the very high concentrations in groundwater in which we live is a direct health concern for infants. And then when it gets out of the surface water, it causes nuisance algae growth, which has some real issues for subsequent chlorination disinfection byproducts for public, for surface water users and stuff like that. It can also be more than nuisance algae growth in terms of cyanobacteria and things like mm -hmm. that, which yeah. have their own toxins as well. Other questions? In these three yeah. areas, uh, are those kind of considered like legacy like heritage steady state system? Uh, it, it sort of spans everything, right? I mean, I mean, I mean, the, the upper Clark Fork is, cert is certainly a legacy. Um, the you know uh, uh, is you know, and it suffers from activities that started 150 years ago. Uh, activities in the Judith are you know are you know don't go back quite that far. Certainly not the intensive. Uh, and they are continuing. Okay. Um, the powder is something that's you know, relatively new, you know, in, a, in an earth science way of thinking. Uh, it is, as you know, Julia called it, you know, what, one reason she was she's enamored with with the activities out there. It's, it's it, no pun intended. I mean, she called it the wild, 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 wild west, as far as regulation, far as as far as you know, it is. Everyone can be very opportunistic in terms of what they do. And the issue in the powder that you know, wasn't hinted at here was um, when the landscape gets disturbed, there are um, what are called spoils or spoils piles that are, that, that are created and, and um, you know, just big, massive heaps of broken rock. Uh, a lot of it's gypsum, so calcium sulfate. And you, know, you take high surface, area, high surface area gypsum, you expose it to water either through streams, through rivers, or rain, okay? um, and starts to dissolve. And you get sulfate concentrations 
they get to really, really high levels. I think when you get above a gram per liter, right? So, so you know, so sort of PPT levels, um, it, livestock start to die. You know, this actually happened in Canada when, in, in, in some waterways where, where the sulfate levels got up, I think the uh, uh, four and a half grams per liter of you know, uh, dissolved sulfate, okay? And so, you, you, you know, that's the place where you have new introductions of contaminants, you know, specifically in the form of sulfates. Now into the water, in, in, into the watershed, and what impact does that have both on the ecology, on you know, on 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 on, on rangeland practices, and, and what's the chemistry? You know how, you know, can sulfate dissolution be suppressed through the application of surfactants? You know, you know and use natural surfactants so that you know, hopefully it minimizes ecological impact. Are there there are an awful lot of questions there that you know right now we just don't know the answer to. Um, and that's, so in a, you know, long answer to a short question, but it really spans the legacy to uh, emerging threats to contaminants in water systems. Uh, Julie, did I get most of that right? Yeah. Okay, good, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, anything from Missoula? Are there any other questions from the outside of MSU room? Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Again, th uh, thank you much. <laughs> Last thing. Um, uh, yeah, because the structure of the F score 